Hey everyone, welcome back to Observe. In today's video, we're going to be analyzing the nonverbal communication of Casey Anthony from the recent documentary released on Peacock that she stars in largely that has been fairly controversial for the past while here. So we're picking up from where we left off in the last video. If you haven't seen the prior videos on this, I suggest going and checking those out. However, today we're going to be looking at both Casey Anthony and some other people as well. So stay tuned. Uh, I think that's enough. Let's go ahead and roll the intro. Today's video is brought to us by Blinkist. I've been researching and teaching nonverbal communication for over 10 years now, but I still greatly enjoy intaking literature centered around the field. I spend hours a week reading, but not everybody has the time and ability to do that. With that in mind, are you tired of being overwhelmed by the sheer number of books that you might want to read, but simply just do not have the time? You wish that you could quickly access important insights and ideas from your favorite books without having to read the entire thing. If so, then I do think you should join Blinkist. Blinkist provides access to a library of over 5,500 book overviews, or blinks as they call them, on a variety of topics such as business, personal, health, and more than that as well. Each blink is meticulously crafted by a team of experts and condenses the book's key ideas and insights into only 15 minutes of reading time. While blinks shouldn't completely take the place of your normal reading, it can certainly improve your time efficiency while reading. A blink that I personally suggest you start with if you are interested in the subjects of this channel and would possibly like to begin studying them for yourself is The Silent Language of Leaders by Carol Kinsey Gelman. It provides a quality introduction to how the reading and usage of body language can affect your life in very tangible and powerful ways. However, say you weren't big into reading. Blinkist also provides audio versions of each Blink, allowing you to listen to them while on the go. Furthermore, with the Blinkist app, you can access your summaries at any time from any location on any device. Finally, Blinkist Connect is a new feature which allows every Blinkist premium plan to be shared by two different accounts with no additional cost, functioning in essence like a two for the price of one deal. It enables you to invite a second person to your plan if they accept your invitation. The owner of the second account will be able to receive complete premium access to Blinkist. Click the link to start your seven day free trial and get 25% off a premium membership. Thank you again to Blinkist for sponsoring this video and back to our regularly scheduled programming. Okay, like I said, if you haven't seen the other videos, I do suggest you go and check those out first, especially if you want a backstory. If you're not familiar with this case, go and check out those other videos as well. Um, that, that's all though. Let's go ahead and just dive right into the actual analysis itself. whole United States is looking for our Kaylee. Are we going to be able to find her, do you think? I hope we can, Mom. I believed that she was still okay. I'm going to go ahead and pause here. So this is a little clip of the phone call that a lot of people mention and the lack of emotion that seems to be displayed by Casey at this point. So many people are questioning, so why is she so emotionless during this time, during the time that would it would be more raw, more recent, more real to her? as opposed to this years of separation between the instance. And that is a very good question. That's something that even myself, I'm keeping my eye out for as I continue through to see, are there areas of desynchronization that I might not have been aware of? Anything along those lines, because it is a fascinating contrast between the two. And you'll see throughout the documentary that there are some things brought in that are supposed to be providing reasons for that on some level. But um, let's, let's go ahead and flash forward. We just saw this little bit here, also non-verbally speaking, I hope so, mom. There's a little bit of a micro shake no in there. Maybe that's related to the unbelievableness, or perhaps it's because Casey knows that that's not the case. And what's fascinating to me is that, and you know what, actually, no, I'll just let us, we'll watch, we'll watch and you'll get to see. So I know you want to ask me about the last day she was here, the last day that I saw her, the day she disappeared. 
I know that's what it's all leading up to. <laughs> I can tell you about what I remember from that morning. It's not much the night before. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pause. So we're seeing a lot of crying in this area. There is inflammation around the eyes, around the nose. And people have brought up, it is possible to be able to act, to rely on other memories, to be able to invoke these sorts of emotions, to be able to pull off what looks to be and appears to be genuine emotion. Now, that is the possibility here, especially in that it is synchronized. I will note that it does seem as though as it's changing from these different camera angles, there are some some periods of time in between the cuts. So that is going to make things a little bit more complicated. However, we're seeing quite a few preening gestures in there as well, meaning that, that at very least... Casey is aware of how she's appearing and pushing the hair out of her face, which the face is the focus of this. So it's fascinating. Let's continue watching. The night before was a normal night. Got Kaylee to bed. Woke up the next morning, got her breakfast. I wasn't feeling that great. And I wanted to lay down. Put on the TV. The door was closed. And I had her lay in bed with me. I've been a light sleeper my entire life because I'm used to someone opening the door while I'm asleep. I'm used to being on alert, especially with my child next to me. It's part of the reason she slept in bed with me so much, in my bed with pillows stuffed against the wall with the bed up against it so she couldn't fall so the bed couldn't move. Were the doors unlocked to your bedroom? I thought that I had locked it, but Maybe not. It's pop. Okay. So a lot of details around certain facets of it. Casey's obviously trying to hammer home this idea of she was a very overwhelmingly good and uh, providing parent provided security and protection and care, which there are obviously some indicators that that's not the case. And then this fascinating story about how she is always a very, very light sleeper, but she was not able to feel any of this happen is in and of itself interesting to me. Especially that Casey herself is calling out, I am a light sleeper. This doesn't fit that pattern. I slept too hard. And what I, what I find very, very interesting throughout this is that Casey has no problems admitting that what she did was weird uh, all the way around, that it, it seemed to be abnormal behavior. She herself has commented that and, and said that multiple times throughout. But there are rarely any other reasons for it. It, it it's just like she's like yeah that's so that is that is so str so strange so strange and then tries to move on by it and so she does that regularly which this can be a level of manipulation a person who is understanding how to lie as i've even brought up on this channel multiple times it is less likely for a person who is deceitful to admit any level of wrong they always try to appear completely innocent however casey is trying to admit that she's not innocent on some levels, and while also still maintaining this overall arching umbrella of she's completely innocent. So it's fascinating. It could be a point of manipulation. This would be something that you would want to be able to keep, uh, keep track of the storylines, make sure that everything's lining up back around, trace to see if what she's saying this time lines up to other times and what other people say, so on and so forth. But there is that possibility of manipulation in there, so we would want to pay attention. Let's continue. It's possible that the door was unlocked. I know my dad was at home. But I fell asleep and was asleep for a while. And I was awoken by him shaking me and asking me where Kaylee was, which didn't make sense because I looked next to me and that's where she was. The TV was still on. She would never even leave my room without telling me even if she had to go to the bathroom. She'd never just leave me there. She knew she wasn't allowed to just be in the house by herself. And I immediately start looking around the house. Her room, what used to be my brother's room, in the So now Casey has brought up another thing to where it just... Casey almost seems to be arguing against her own case now to where it's like, no, this does not line up. Kaylee wouldn't have gotten up and done these things. And... I'm not a light sleeper, and 
yeah, my behavior is strange. If you've watched the other videos, she says this. Yeah, it, it, I'm, it is emotionless. It's weird. It's strange. She admits that she behaves strangely. So she's just admitting that more or less from everybody else's perspective that, yeah, what we're picking up on on the obvious red flags of this storyline are very much genuinely there. So then what that leaves us doing is if she's admitting that, then why is she admitting that if she's guilty? Well, Casey is a pretty good liar. Uh, to, to put it frankly, she herself has said that she has lied all throughout her life, is very good at it, and my bet would be that she'll continue to do so. She's saying that she obviously has set the lying aside for this interview, um, but I don't know. I don't necessarily buy that. I don't, I don't necessarily buy that a liar is going to set aside lying for a specific interview that would really benefit if they lied. So that is a part of it. And we're seeing some of these interesting facets that are brought up that still seem to push us towards suspicion towards Casey for sure. Let's continue watching. In the bathroom, my parents are in the garage. I go outside and I'm looking to see where she could be. She's not in her playhouse. Where is she? Why is she not here? Didn't make sense. Still doesn't make sense. She'd never done that before. Why that day? Did you look inside the pool? Didn't have to. By the time I came back around from the left side of the house, I came back around towards the front porch. She's standing there with her. She's soaking wet. <sighs> this part makes me feel but uncomfortable largely because of the eye contact that Casey is holding during this time. Very traumatic event, recollecting spatial memories, things like that. And she holds very steady eye contact. This is to make sure that the words that she's saying are landing and, and, and are hitting emotionally. This is done very, very regularly by people who are familiar with lying. They will watch to see if their lie is landing or not. And so we're seeing her do this throughout all of this entire time. And now it's like, okay, now I have to, I have, to have an emotional part. So she breaks and she looks down and does another preening gesture and a sigh. And this entire thing feels orchestrated to me on some level. Now, whether or not that's because it's orchestrated for the interview or orchestrated because it's false, it's too difficult to say right now. However, judging by the rest of the evidence given, we do know that Casey is a liar, a self-admitted liar, and this is an odd patterning to have here. So it's, it's definitely not aiding towards her innocence, but it's not something that's enough to say, well, obviously guilty. Let's go ahead and move. Um, that being said, let's go ahead and continue watching. I can see him standing there with her in his arms and hand her to me and telling me that it's my fault, that I did that, that I caused that. And I just collapsed with her in my arms. A lot of disgust and contempt coming into the corners of Casey's nose during that time. That would make sense both ways contextually to have a father accuse if that's the case, which we've already pointed out some of the possible flaws on this. But if the father is accusing the child, there would be some frustration, perhaps some indignation, some almost righteous indignation from the child if the child did not do such a terrible thing. And then it shifts again into how how Casey was collapsing with with Kaylee. And so I'm fascinated by this aggression, which this has been mentioned before in this series, this aggression that does come out. It is something that I want to keep note of. In this area, the aggression towards her father outweighs the pain of the situation. So she's more angry at her father or she's displaying more anger towards her father than she is pain about the situation that she's saying happened. So that is a fascinating thing to me. Um, I do tend to go towards which emotions seem to be more genuine. If they're more authentic, then I want to I want to dig at that point because that would seem to be the, the more likely place to find the truth. So looking at that, I'm just going to keep it in mind as I continue forward that that agitation towards the father is fairly prevalent um, while downplaying a little bit of the actual death of Kaylee. Let's continue. What did she feel like? She was heavy. She was cold. <sighs> As I'm sitting there with her on my lap, just hysterical. Just staring at her, not knowing what to do. He takes her from me and he 
immediately softens his tone and tells me it's gonna be okay. That she was going to be okay. That's what he said to me. I wanted to believe him. Interesting tense change that we're having here in the sentence. She's talking as if it's in present, which is common, especially in in recollecting what could be traumatic events, that speaking as if you're reliving it at that moment could definitely be in there. But now she's switched to everything was past tense, and that switch is common in storytelling as well. Regardless, though, it did fit in with her verbal patterning a little bit. It, it, it was kind of masked, but it is something that I want to make note of because that can be an indicator of a faked story or a forced story, or even if it's a partially constructed story, which if we know Casey and how she functions with her lying, she is going to be mixing in ed ed elements of truth to whatever storyline she's going to say because she knows that that is how you convince people. Because if you're saying the truth on uh, parts of it, then they might see that part and focus on that part. So that is just something to keep in mind. Yeah, let's just keep watching. Because I wanted her to be okay. <laughs> And I don't know how long I sat outside. I don't know where he went. He took her from me and he walked away. I know he went back in through the screen doors and he went back into the house. But I don't know where she went. And I don't know what he did. I just want her back. <laughs> it's all I've wanted this entire time. Can tell you about how okay so that's all i wanted this entire time long look down there i'm not buying that that's all i wanted the entire time side of things largely because even just evidentiarily speaking throughout this we have not seen that kind of behavior from casey especially back on the initial days now the initial days is going to be explained here in this video a little bit as to why she may have been behaving so abnormally but I don't necessarily buy it. That being said, for the sake of being able to keep, like I said, an open mind on this and hopefully being able to, to pick away at this until whatever's left is hopefully the truth, we're going to keep watching through this to try to be able to add as much information as we can. It, we're just seeing some fascinating things play out here that aren't necessarily helping Casey's case. Let's go. About how numb I felt and how broken I felt and confused, but also hopeful because I believed that she was still okay. And I know people are going to question, well, why didn't I make a phone call? Why didn't I call 911? Why did I even wait to tell my mom anything? But I didn't tell her anything. Why lie? Why not do a hundred things a hundred different ways? But I have to live with that. Knowing that I failed to protect my child. And that I kept failing her even after that. I failed her again and again and again because I still protected the person who hurt me. It was like I was brainwashed. And it wasn't... So this is a fascinating point. Um, I am not personally a parent. So I can't say what I would or would not do for my child. Um, I have had experience with parents and that I have had some myself and know some parents as well. And for the most part, if the parent is as loving, caring, compassionate a parent as what Casey is painting herself out to be, there is most of the time nothing that you wouldn't do for your child. At least that's what I've been told. I can even attest that for my puppies to a lesser degree. So there is that level of something that I'm just keeping in mind contextualized with the behavior that Casey was also displaying at the time, this is this would be an enormous red flag to me, just even behaviorally, how she's going about this and how she's displaying, and even now how this is coming out this way. This all seems very, very convenient um, as far as the storyline goes without actually admitting any mistakes. There are some odd points in this that are just rubbing me a little bit the wrong way. However, let's continue watching. And it wasn't until much later that I started to really realize why. 
this is a living embodiment of hell for me. Yeah, this is not entirely one of those places I'd like to go back and try to walk back through memory lane. How long were you in the Orange County Jail? Three years. I was indicted on October 14th of 2008, and I was released after the verdict. She had that answer so ready. How long have, were you in that? Three years. I was in there for three years, so that means that at least she's angry about that. That is a prepared, she's ruminated on that. And that has been one of the more quick, prompt, passionate responses that we've seen from Casey so far is this three years of being in jail. She feels very not okay about that, which that makes sense. Very few people are like, oh, yes, I was, I super loved my time in jail or prison. It was a good time. Uh, that, so that does make sense to be in there. However, we're just seeing that, that, at least Casey has a pretty high focus on how everything has affected her throughout this. And there is actually very little that focuses on Kaylee. Despite the fact that Casey herself said that all of this was supposed to be for Kaylee. Mm, fascinating. It seems as though it's for Casey. Let's go. A few days after the verdict in July of 2011. What did you hear in the cell? Screaming, yelling. It's never quiet. The doors are metal and they clink and they're loud. What do you smell? Feces, um, other people's body odor because it's a recycled air system. Um, pepper spray, if they had to pepper spray someone inside of the unit or sometimes even from the neighboring unit. I was waiting in jail, being accused of a crime that I didn't commit. Remembering feeling alone I was about to pause. I was like, mm, I feel like there's about to be some self-pity tears coming in here. And sure enough, being accused for a crime I didn't commit. Now the tears are coming up. She's hurt uh, in self-pity. And once again, we have already discussed this in the other videos. Let's see how that plays out with some other areas where there should be genuine grief, comparing context and everything like that. So let's continue. And helpless and having literally no one in my corner during that period of time anger in there as well both with the lowering and drawing together the eyebrows and then the tensing of the upper lip while she is feeling angry and expressing this anger and hurt uh, all again centered around herself let's continue watching i needed someone to talk to my name is robin mcdonnell i was indicted under the name robin adams i came to meet Casey Anthony in the Orange County Jail after I was arrested for conspiracy to drug trafficking marijuana. When I was transported to Orange County Jail, I went into solitary confinement. You're locked down for 23 hours a day. It's a box, it's a shoe box, it's a Tupperware. The lid only comes off when they take it off. So this is a fascinating display of genuine emotion. This person more or less befriended Casey. And we're seeing genuine grief from this person as she's genuinely trying to and attempting to hold it back and hide it by her face staying largely emotionless. And this could be because of maybe plastic surgery or anything along those lines. Botox could also be a factor in there. However, Along with that, you could see that she's wiping tears away and trying to blink the tears away while not showing any other evidence of grief. So she's trying to maintain composure and switch that around to how Casey portrays hers. And it's a lot more flamboyant on Casey's side. So this person obviously isn't trying to convey this was terrible for me, but I feel that a lot more genuinely than I would from Casey's side of things. But let's continue watching here. Casey was put into solitary confinement as well. I kept seeing this young girl, short black hair, just really petite. And um, one time I just waved to her. It's just a little, little wave. One day, Casey I find that interesting, the slip up that was said there, the petite, instead of it being petite, it was starting off to be pretty. Also, we're about to look at some notes that were some letters that were handed back and forth. And it, it, it's just some fascinating. They seem to be genuinely very close. And if that's the case, I don't know how much of this person's testimony you can necessarily buy into, especially if there was a level of 
uh, like closeness that it seems to be betraying here. Let's let's watch. Casey used sign language to tell me that she wrote to me and put it in a book. And we started writing back and forth. We started to uh, get to know each other through letters. It's our handwriting. <laughs> it says Cookie. She called me Cookie. I'm an emotional wreck. I've gotten good at hiding how I feel with most people, but I can't with you. We have so very much in common, both the good and the bad. I think that I wrote to Robin. Okay, so that lets us know a little bit more about Casey's approach. There seems to be at least a level of intimate connection between the two of them. There is that possibility of a not very uh, unbiased answer, perhaps one that might be a little bit lilted towards Casey, which seems to be the MO of this entire docuseries. Uh, but let's continue watching. To Robin Adams and told her what had happened to me because I was really just starting to come to grips with what had happened. I don't really remember Robin's response to anything, but it felt like there was actually someone who understood. Long before I had ever been arrested, I had memories of the abuse, but it wasn't until I was isolated from my family in jail that I started to remember more of the details. Well, I started to have very clear images and flashbacks, nightmares and seizures, all because of things that I was reliving from what happened with my father. So at that time you're talking- And to have a time of solitary and isolation like that can definitely invoke different psychological thinking. Absolutely, that would make sense in that, in that area. Let's continue watching through it here. At that time, you're talking to Robin Adams in the jail? Yes. Had you told your defense team about the abuse? No. It was still really hard to talk about the abuse. There was so much anger and grief and sadness and shame. So I hadn't talked to my team about it yet. I hadn't said anything to them. The media was portraying Casey as this young- I'm going to go ahead and pause. We're on to a different person here. I find that decision pretty fascinating, especially because it seems as though it would have a very, very critical role in, in showing that Casey would be largely innocent or could be largely innocent. So that, that fact that she never once brought it up is fascinating. That also being said, the climate for that is not necessarily welcoming, especially during this time. So perhaps she felt like she would not have a, ver a voice to be heard. There is that possibility. Um, we're going to go ahead and listen to this. This person was on uh, Casey's team here. Young mother uh, who's out partying for 30 days while her daughter was missing. How could that possibly happen? When you've been a victim of sexual abuse, you pretend that nothing is wrong. It's the separation of the mind from the actions, right? That's how Casey can show up as if she had no troubles in the world during the 31 days where she's lost her baby, Kaylee. Fine. I find that fascinating. That is true. Psychologically speaking, even that level of dissociation can absolutely play a part in this. And that could be an excuse for some of the actions that are being done. However, it does not... It, it, it only excuses what seems to be the lack of action, that dissociation, pretending that everything's fine. It's just not showing that things are bad. What is fascinating and what a lot of people have difficulty with and isn't acknowledged here are the conscious then choices that Casey then made to go to various things. And that isn't necessarily excused by dissociation. That is just an area that is fascinating. So I do agree with this. Absolutely. How, how she has presented this is very true but it doesn't necessarily actually clear Casey's side of things. It just provides a, a possible reason for a portion of her behavior. Uh, it, it's, it's not enough to suffice, but it is still very much uh, something that needs to be taken into consideration. Finding evidence, which is part of my job as mitigation specialist, um, any evidence of abuse is very difficult, especially with the passing of time. But Casey did tell people about being abused even before any of this happened. Good afternoon, Mr. Grant. Good afternoon. Jesse was her fiance. She trusted Jesse. 
And so she did disclose to him about being abused by her brother. It's something that was shared even before Kaylee passed in 2008. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop it here. This is another halfway through the next episode of this docuseries. If you would like me to continue, once again, let me know in the comments below. As long as these are tracking okay and you're interested in it, then I will continue to break down this case for us. So what we're seeing here are some some actually arguably good reasonings behind some of Casey's behaviors with the possibility of this uh, parent-child abuse situation and all of the trauma that can go into that and how that plays out. There is that possibility, and I think it's something that needs to have weight added to it. We did see some other areas where it does seem as though Casey might be forcing or play-acting a hair. That's kind of her MO. We, 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 we kind of expect that by now. And then we're finding these areas that it still doesn't connect up regardless of the reasons given as opposed to what was seen. So on the case with the 31 days or however many of partying and having a great time, how come she didn't look like she was bothered could have been dissociation could have been she's practiced at that but then that still begs the question okay but then why why go out still unless that was her her thing maybe she was just a, a partier we're looking at this and judging from the other videos as well casey is still trying to build herself up to be a white knight while admitting these mistakes that she's made oh i did act strange there that is really weird drops it leaves it never addresses that again you know, I could have called people. I didn't do that. Drops it, leaves it, never does it again. Like, it's just fascinating that she knows that she could have done so many things differently or should have done so many things differently and that it was very strange that she didn't and doesn't acknowledge why. Except for this new little bit of information here, which doesn't fully answer the question. So there are some red flags. There's still definitely a mystery here. I'm still not necessarily uh, buying Casey's story on this. I'm not team Casey for this. If you did like this video, go ahead and hit the like button. Hit subscribe if you haven't already. Reach out to the socials. I should be over there fairly often. Uh, if you would like to be able to see more videos like this, they should be coming out at least once a week. Um, but, but without further ado, that's all that I've got for the day. My name is Logan and you have been oh so awesome as you always are. And I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys.